Looking at pictures from space, it's easy to think that water is bountiful. And, well it is. Up to 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in this miraculous molecule. In fact, only 3% of that water is at a salinity of 0.05% or less. Fresh water. With two thirds of that water locked up in glaciers and unobtainable underground. Freshwater habitats represent less than 0.01% of the Earth's entire surface area, but support more than 100,000 animal species. These habitats are amongst the most overused, developed and polluted places in the world. With more than half the world's wetlands vanishing since the year 1900, and fewer than 70 of the world's 177 major rivers remain clear and free-flowing of man-made obstructions. Surprised? Freshwater biodiversity is threatened across the globe. Protecting these resources requires knowledge in a broad range of habitats. There isn't enough time to cover all freshwater ecosystems, so I'll cover one. Rivers. While the idea of conserving rivers is not new, Hopefully I can shed some light into the threat river biodiversity is under. What are ecosystem services? It's how the ecosystem positively contributes to the human existence, whether that's directly or indirectly. For example, food, water, wood, and other raw materials, as well as animals, plants, and fungus impact on the regulating dispersal of nutrients, water purification, and prevention of erosion. Not to mention the cultural relationships many communities have with their rivers, especially when you think of the significance of rivers amongst religions like Hinduism. Biodiversity's importance in these systems relates back to the year 5000 BC, to what is thought to be one of the first large-scale civilizations ever, the early Mesopotamia civilization, founded on the banks of two parallel rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. The first settlers found it easy to live there, due to the abundance of wildlife in which to hunt, and the banks of the river, which, when untouched, have some of the most fertile ground in the world, due to the years of silt depositing on its banks. As the civilization became more developed, the rivers were used as a highway for trade, from their famous metalwork to woolen fabrics, pottery, fish, wheat, and most notably, paper. Tin, copper, and timber were important as an exchange. They also had a deep connection to the god of the river, Enki. What we use our rivers for at present has not changed too much from those early settlers, but how we fish, trade, etc. has changed significantly, from those small wooden boats used for trade to the 71,000 ton vessels that routinely migrate up and down some of our largest rivers, the small fish traps to the massive nets and industrial level fishing, from building a humble settlement for a few people also the enormous cities like London, New York, Shanghai, Cairo, the list goes on. Having this healthier population of flora and fauna benefits life in such a way that without this they are potentially genetically more susceptible to change in their environment. By having a high population of a species there is more of a chance for a genetic mutation which may help against diseases down the line. And as we all know Animals that live in water are very acute to change in temperature, salinity, pH, and toxins. The point I'm trying to make is that there isn't a problem with using these rivers for these services. It's how sustainable and disruptive modern methods are. And to contrast it back to a time when even then, people knew how to sustainably harvest their resources. Having this healthier population of flora and fauna benefits life in such a way that without this, they are potentially genetically more susceptible to change in their environment. By having a high population of a species, there is more of a chance for a genetic mutation, which may help against alien or native diseases down the line. And as we know, most animals that live in water are very acute to change in temperature, salinity, pH and toxins. This is relevant for all species that live in and around the river. Having a loss of a certain species of predator may impact the food chain. Why? With a reduced number of that predator in the ecosystem, their prey becomes more abundant. This is especially apparent in agriculture, where the loss of a predator such as stoats and weasels cause the pests, like mice and rats, to rise in population, eating the crops and potentially spreading disease to livestock.
The variety of species in an ecosystem is the obvious thought when talking about biodiversity, but how significant is it? The productivity of the ecosystem is based on the relationship all species have with each other. Each species has a specific role to play, whether it's something as big as a predator-prey relationship, or the fungus that decomposes waste, arguably the most important component. No matter how niche something is, everything has a role to play. Species diversity is also applied when talking about the sustainability and longevity of an ecosystem. The more components there are, the less likely, if a species goes extinct, the whole system collapses in on itself. In other words, if it is two or more species competing for the same resource, and one happens to die out, there isn't a role to fill, as, as the one competing in the first place is now filled in. Species such as the Chinook salmon, that travel 2,000 miles up the Yukon River roughly every year, are a key component to the river ecosystem. Although the salmon don't live in the river all year round, their simple migration really highlights the importance of a stable fish supply for the surrounding forest wildlife. Animals such as bears, wolves, eagles, ravens, wolverines, otters, minks, and, and the bobcat use it as an easy way of building up fat reserves for the long and difficult winter ahead. One study placed tracking and speed recording devices on the backs of some of these fish, and found that the movement rates of Chinook salmon had declined from 51 kilometers to 26 kilometers a day for 99% of the salmon traveling up the Yukon Flats, theorizing that the slower swim speeds were as a result of physical barriers put up by people. However, the other 1% was actually going faster than previously recorded. It was presumed that those salmon travelled in less challenging conditions, using sections of the river that had a deep channel carved into the bottom of them, done by people as a way of flood prevention. It allowed the fish to travel out of sight of predators and with no obstructions, and with predators finding it hard to find the salmon, they would be forced to move further downstream. And if we know anything about the capacity of an ecosystem, as well as territories, not every animal can win. Erosion, the physical degradation of something. Erosion is the cause of the destruction of the land in and around the river, directly affecting the transport of sediment downstream, causing the banks to slope and to put the surrounding land at risk of flooding, which is all managed by the presence of vegetation underwater and along the bank. A study conducted along the Haraz River in Iraq was looking at the impact of vegetation on bank erosion. It concluded that native grasses are suitable for the management of bank erosion, Biological methods are generally the best methods for controlling it. The data indicated that there's a connection between the effects of vegetation establishment in riverbanks and the rate of erosion. Socioeconomical impact of rivers. Water resources play a major social and economical role in many countries. To measure the impact it has on lives in West Africa, Research done by a man by the name of Owenba Aduse at the University of Cape Coast, Ghana, talks about the socio-economical impact of the country's three main river systems. He first of all talks about a very significant figure, that just one of the river systems accounts for about 70% of the country's water resources. The leftover 30% is covered by the smaller two river basins of the country. It must be emphasised that these water resources play a very significant role in the social and economical lives of the people of Ghana. He then goes on to talk about the rivers facilitate the movement of both goods and passengers from one point to another across the country, historically used for the transport of timber, bushmeat and the notorious slave trade. Although two out of the three are not practised anymore, they still use the rivers for timber transport. Nowadays, the rivers are used for transporting heavy items such as minerals, cement, machines, oil, yam, cattle, and ground nuts. Secondly, the river has an important role in employment for the region. Jobs like fishing, boat taxis, and miners receive a very healthy income in a country where the minimum living wage is roughly £90 a month. As well as the employment it brings, it also helps children from rural communities travel safely to and from school, which is undisputable when talking about economic benefits in the long term. The more educated the population becomes, there is more of an economic potential for the individual and for the country. Thirdly, the generation of hydroelectric power, supporting 40% of the total population of the country. For example, the Akasobo Dam finished construction in 1966, built by the first president of Ghana, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. It is theorised to be the most important producer in the country for power generation, single-handedly running both industries and homes. 
also powering the number one employer for the region, an aluminium smelting company. Fourthly, according to Aduce, the river assists in agriculture. Undisputably, Ghana's agriculture industry is the mainstay of the country's economy, employing approximately 70% of the labour force, with nearly every family engaged in farm. It's quite clear to see this as a major industry for the country, and with the ever-increasing population, there are calls to change from the small-scale subsistence farming to the more productive and efficient irrigation farming. I think it's certainly safe to say that these three main river basins are the economical foundation of Ghana. In a country where the vast majority of people use it for trade, travel, power, employment and farming, with the focus of the country shifting to the ever-popular Western business model, productivity before everything, is the river going to meet the same fate as so many have? Are the pollutants going to get too much? Are they going to continue to use sustainable farming methods? Can these new farming methods even sustain a growing population? What happens if they overuse the resource and many of the tributaries dry up? What does this mean for the people and wildlife of Ghana? Values and ethics Each country has their own cultural and ethical values. Not all align with the standards we're used to. When it comes to wildlife, some seek to exploit, for attracting tourists, some for the resources they hold, and some want nothing to do with it. Others embrace, and the whole world revolves around it. For example, to be accepted into Buddhism is required you to show kindness and respect for all living things, and to do as little harm to animals as possible. And karma states that if you are to do any harm, it will have to be paid back, and to avoid any involvement with an animal's death. To contrast it, Historically, in parts of non-Muslim Saudi Arabia, which later became the United Arab Emirates, during the 1960s, one of their leisure activities was to go out on dune buggies into the desert and would hunt down the oryx, ultimately causing the extinction of the Arabian oryx in the region, although they have been now introduced back into the country. In order to protect a river, there are certain legislative requirements that need to be considered. For example, in Australia, it must be spatially configured to accommodate ecological processes such as dispersal, local extinctions and recolonizations, and possible adjustments of species distribution to climate change. A typical conservation plan involves first identifying measurable features of biodiversity and then setting quantitative targets for including these features in areas where protection measures will be applied. Although in more rural communities, legislation doesn't always make too much of a difference, the community is sometimes the most difficult to get on your side. However, to persuade the general public that there is something to be cherished as a whole is no easy task. By educating people about the effect on wildlife these ecosystems have, people are more likely to respect and treat them as a valuable resource. For example, all the attention the media is attracting for water pollutants is pushing forward the legislation and bringing it to the forefront of people's minds. To show support, Canada aims to ban single-use plastics by the year 2021. Peru and the EU have already banned it including some major companies which have taken strides to cut down to only the most essential plastics. New issues are being talked about each year, from invasive species to erosion, acidification, noise, light, air and plastic pollution. Conservation of our global flora and fauna is being cared for better than ever before. Where conservationists are doing the research, more often than not, volunteers are putting that research into practice. Citizen science in which non-professionals have done over 10,000 species distribution maps in the UK alone. 